secrets of our backyards to the realities of the third world. We take a raw and real look into the challenges and the pursuits of social justice. Welcome to The Point. I'm Callie and I will be your guide as we explore through the intimate and sometimes humorous conversations with some of the world's most influential people who are combating some of the world's toughest problems. We offer a straight talk approach to examining education, healthcare, and entrepreneurship. We will learn what works and what can be avoided because together we can and we will change the world. We have an awesome world changer with us today. His energy is contagious and his work is impressive. After graduating with an undergrad in public health and a master's of healthcare administration and policy from City University in New York, he committed his career to improving quality of healthcare for at-risk communities in countries like Haiti and Ghana. He is a seasoned global public health administrator who knows how to engage communities in various sectors both nationally and globally, to create sustainable systemic strategies surrounding public health. He's the founder, president, and CEO of CapraCare. Welcome to the show, Jean-Pierre. Hello, John. Hey, Kelly. How are you? We're doing good. It is Friday when we are recording this, and we have had a long week, but we're excited to talk about some important topics today. Yes, and it's not just Friday, by the way. It's Friday, duh. 13th <laughs> so we'll see we'll see what what happens between now and when when this gets aired so super excited john john pierre is has an incredible background um i was able to speak to him um prior to this and originally learned from him about him on um the global health pursuit podcast um, and through my work in Haiti, was especially excited um, to hear about what he's doing. So, John, if you could um, just give us a brief background about yourself and how you got involved in what you're doing now. All right. So, who I am and what I do. So, I'm Jean Pierre Louis. Uh, first name Jean, last name Pierre Louis. But folks love to say Jean Pierre, so I, we go with Jean Pierre. That's quite fine. And every once in a while, you hear JPL. So I was born in Haiti, left um, Haiti when I was well, about nine years old and came to the United States. Um, and when I came to the United States, I was thinking, hey, this is the land of the free that they've been saying. This is paradise. I'm going to find money everywhere, flowers everywhere, beautiful homes, all that good stuff. Um, when I got to the airport, I landed, I was like, oh, of course, JFK, New York City. I was it's like I was like, oh, this is this is very cold. Um, but when I was breathing, I was like, oh, look at this! I can smoke. I can smoke for free. I can't <laughs> wait for Uncle Joe to come to the United States because he smokes in Haiti, so he'll smoke here for free. He won't have to buy cigarettes anymore. But um, a little bit later, when I started going to school, the kids started calling me Haitian booty scratcher. Go back home. You have HIV, HBO, Haitian body order. I didn't know what HBO meant at that time. Um, I learned later it meant Haitian body order. By the time I was in junior high school, I could only spent one year um, in, the, in the fifth grade. Then, um, because because the only HBO I knew was the the cable HBO. Um, to make a long story short, I was like, oh, what is this all this HIV about? I don't know what that is. I don't have HIV. You know. Uh, we're not booty scratches. People work hard to try to make a living. This is this is this is not what I was envisioned of America. So I said, you know what? I am gonna go back home. I'm gonna go back home and make back home a more productive place to live. I'm gonna create. I'm gonna create a business, some kind of organization that's gonna provide jobs. That was the only focus, jobs. Because I know, my if my mom had a job, a better job back in Haiti, she would not be here. A lot of the Haitians who left Haiti, they left because of a job. So I said, I'm going to get this education and I'm going to make the best of it and go back to Haiti and create an organization that's going to give jobs to Haitians so therefore they don't have to leave Haiti and come to the United States and be disrespected like I was being disrespected. Well, listen, you know, after graduating my junior high school, high school and got to college, I realized, okay, I won't be able to change everything, 
but I am going to start that organization. And that's when I um, was introduced to public health. And then from that point, I said, ah, this is the perfect um, career cho um, choice I should make. Because public health, you could do a program that can impact individuals, community, have a greater impact and still provide jobs, very low cost and everything else. And so by the time I was done with my um, undergrad in public health, I then continue on um, and, and worked for a few years, went back for my master's. I spent two years of doing research for capital care. And then I started capital care as a school-based health organization. And here we are, 11 years later, we are full blown organization, um, impacting Haiti, providing job, and our focus is strictly development. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, so 11 years now that it's been happening. Tell us a little bit about what you've learned from, you know, thinking back to like maybe even the first year. Were you very, would you consider some of the decisions like naive or did you feel like you had a pretty good grasp of what needed to be accomplished when you first started and then compared to modern day? When I first started, um, I didn't have a good grasp of anything. I had never run an organization before. I had never done fundraising before. I had never managed a board, um, you know, all the marketing stuff. I didn't know. But I knew for sure that whatever I was going to be, what I was getting myself into, um, I'm signing in. There is no exit plan. I'm going to get it correct. Um, so lo and behold, like within a year of studying capital care, the Haiti earthquake happened. Um, um, in January 2010. So basically that then propelled us to move quicker because we, we were less than nine months old when the Haiti earthquake happened. Wow. So we've never had any experience with disaster relief, none of that stuff. So uh, one of the biggest things for us before the Haiti earthquake was just training the team, putting them together, having them understand what we are trying to do. In fact, before the Haiti earthquake, one of the one of our programs that we were trying to put together was um, the mental health program. And folks were saying, oh, no, we're not crazy over here. We don't need that. So we pretty much focus on just uh, uh, training them to be able to do health education in school. So we started as a school-based program. As soon as the Haiti earthquake happens, bam, all of a sudden people coming back to Fort Fred, because Capital Care immediately put together a, 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 um, an action plan, we put together a relief team. We went to Haiti. We went to Fort Fred. Now, Fort Fred is in the south. That's Lake Kai. The earthquake happened in Port au Prince. But I knew, you know, we have a lot of people from, from, from Okai, a lot of folks from um, Fort Fred who were living in Port au Prince. So they had to come back. So we didn't go to Port au Prince to do relief. We went straight to Fort Fred. And lo and behold, we found folks who were devastated survivors who had lost lamb and so forth and so on. And then we started to do the whole counseling, psychological first aid. So, yeah, I didn't know a whole lot of things what I was doing, but I just knew that we would get it right. And from that point, we started to get it right and things started to kind of propel and, you know, develop to where we at now. Um, how you are honest about, you know, not, not being able to get it right at the beginning, but I think it comes with a commitment to saying, even if I don't know what I'm doing, I have a commitment to do the best that I can do and to learn as much as possible. Um, what was the, the community's involvement and, and what was their perspective um, about mental health? My personal experience of mental health in Port-au-Prince um, sometimes culturally can be a bit reluctant. Did you also have that experience or did you find that people were more accepting? Well, before the Haiti earthquake, they were not so open to it. After the Haiti earthquake, it becomes like they got it. They understood it. Um, and and, and, and it's, again, it's practically the Haiti earthquake is what creates the whole mental health aspects. But they were very open to it um, the minute they started to understand, okay, what is Because they were giving us their own stories. Uh, we basically rallied some folks who, was, who had survived the Haiti earthquake instead of having honest conversation with them. My whole thing is I knew folks in Haiti needed mental health. From, from my training in public health, I just knew it because there is no help without mental health. That's always been my thing. There's no help without mental health. And the whole mental health prior to Haiti for me was much more um, with my grandmother who had nine kids. And she lost the first six as old as five years old. 
and my mom is the was the seventh child and she survived. And I was like, whoa, what kind of support did she have? How did she have the courage to have more kids after you lose the first one or two or whatever? After the first three, you'd be like, you know what, this is not for me. You lost six kids and you still had the courage to have more kids. So that's where the whole thing, and then of course, maternity, uh, 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 um, uh, um, um, child health issues is, is big in Haiti. So I know she wasn't the only one who had, who had that kind of experience. There were other folks who had it. And that's where I was trying to shift to, but they were like, nah, we good, we okay. So I know they had that kind of issue. But um, sure enough, after the Haiti earthquake, they were much more open and receptive to understand no, it's not about being crazy. It's about having some kind of life trauma, um, crisis that you may have experienced, uh, uh, you know, a death or losing a loved one. This is it's a little bit deeper than that. And you start to do education on mental health, to educate them what it is, and then slowly kind of got into the whole point about some counseling here and there, that kind of thing. Your approach is very holistic. Can you tell us a bit about... Um, what type of programs are included with Capra Care? Well, just to go on with a little bit about the mental health when you mentioned yeah. holistic. Um, so what we've done with the mental health, we add a little bit of acupuncture to it. So we make it more like mental health and wellness. Mm. A little bit uh, um, salt and pepper on it, right? A little acupuncture, a little yoga. Um, I'm big on introducing new things that can enhance the quality of life for anybody um, in, a, in Haiti. So, so that's where we kind of added a little bit more um, component to that program in terms of the holistic. And then we kind of, because oftentimes what you'll hear is people will say, well, huh, they don't need this. They didn't rule Haiti. Why do they need that kind of program for? Well, the same reason why you can use it from anywhere else in the developed countries. Right, the same benefit it gives you in the U.S., Canada, France, uh, the U.K., wherever, they can benefit the same way too. Now, the application may be a little bit different because of the resource, but why can't they use it if 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 we can bring it? Mm -hmm. So we've done that. But one of the core thing for us for our program as we grow was the um, training the locals now mm. to become community health workers. Um, that is the bedrock of Kappa Care. Um, these community health workers have, a, a, um, have an arm in everything that we do at Kappa Care. So we move on. We now got to look more into prevention, health education, beyond the mental health. And then we bring in the health care, the whole wraparound. Right now, one of our flagship programs for health services is cervical cancer um, with prevention and treatment. Um, so we do that. So yeah, so we we have you know evolved to being very very comprehensive um, in our work. So you could come in for one thing, and by the time that you leave, you got all five services. Is the how how the listeners get like a, a visual? Is it that there is an actual medical facility that's Capra Care inside of Haiti, or is it more that individuals are educated by Capra Care and then go out into the community, or is it both? So where we function now used to be one of the, not used to be one of, it was the first quote-unquote modern home in Fort Fred, um built there. So what we did was when the, um, the place basically was being occupied by folks who was living there and no, no longer living there, and so they kind of traveled into the United States and other part of, of, you know, on the other side of, side of the waters, like a Haitian like to say, Lord Boy Blow. So we went there, we rent that house, uh, renovated, and made it into, a, uh, into our office, our health center. So that's where we function now on a daily basis. Our plan within the next um, two to three years is to build a community health center um, in Fulford. And we have a half an acre of land to basically build that um, health center. That would be much more um, bigger than where we are now uh, and provide much more uh, support and services to the community. And the center won't just be about the work that we do, but it's going to be a center that actually help um, provide services for the needs of the community beyond the regular capital care work. It has to be a center that can basically sustain itself because whatever that we do in capital care, 
it has to be to the point where the community has to be able to sustain it. So even if we don't get a dollar in, 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 um, from any foundations or grants or whatever, that it's not just, it's not just done. It's not just dead. It continues. Like right now, Capital Cake is sustained itself um, with the work that we do in Haiti by the staff in Haiti. So we already at a point where that dream has already uh, realized. So that's the ultimate goal is for us to build um, um, a community health center that would be much more comprehensive and be able to provide services to the community at a higher level. Can you tell us a story about um, like maybe one of your favorite success stories of somebody whose life you've seen change through the work of Capra Care? Well, we have many and we even have some on our staff. So like right now, Samson, um, who, who's 21 years old, he just celebrated his birthday, what, three days ago, turned 21. Um, he was 10 years old when he got the capital care in our youth program. And he's now a staff of capital care. He's working with the staff. He is now our um, uh, marketing uh, um, um, coordinator. And his work, ro role is to basically market brand capital care on the ground where he's doing photography and video. Um, and we have other, other um, kids in our, in our program where, you know, they had a hard time going to school. Their parents couldn't pay for their school. And through capital care, we have been able to get them scholarship to a program called HEC, which stands for Help End the Cycle. Um, where we are able to help, you know, uh, provide a tuition to get them assistant to go to school. We have a lady who had um, um, precancerous uh, 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 lesion on her cervix because of capital care. She was able to come in, not just one, but she just she had the whole uh, uh, she had the whole cancer at its early stages. So beyond us taking up the lesion of the uh, of the cervix, she had to have surgery and everything else. So had it not been for capital care, she would have been dead. Um, and there are many other women that we have screened and saved their life through our program. So the stories are endless, um, you know, for as many as, as, as we have um, experienced. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that one of the, the future goals you have is to build the um, community health center. What are some other uh, visions you have for the future of Cabra Care? Well, I want us to be able to provide you know, more um, employment opportunities for folks. Like for instance, right now, the average age of our staff is about 32 years old. Many of them never had a job prior to capital care. So that's the biggest goal for us within the next coming years to provide as much job as possible, um, to be able to expand our services to other parts of Haiti. Our program is built to be uh, replicable. And right now we just got another grant with um, Rotary International through a partnership with uh, Prospect Goshen Rotary Club that we've partnered with them for the past few years. And now we'll be able to implement two mobile sites to provide cervical cancer screening in part of Lake Eye. That is one of our big goals is to spread um, that effort throughout the greater Oak Eye area, starting with the South and then go in other places. We want to be able to have more kids in our youth program where we can help them get more scholarship so they can go to school because it's heartbreaking, um, you know, doing this, doing doing school season to see kids going to school and then they going back home because their parents couldn't pay for the tuition. So we want to be able to to be in that position where we can help those kids. We trained 117 community health workers within the past three years. We want to be able to triple and quadruple those numbers because what that means is there'll be more opportunities for. for to get job because three things happen when you are trained as a community health worker like this through Kappa Care. One, you can keep the knowledge for yourself. Two, you are now more marketable where you can get employment elsewhere. Three, as Kappa Care grows and Kappa Care expands, you can now apply to be employed by us as well. So those are some, some of the um, things that we are looking to do in the next few years. Mm -hmm. Can you give a bit of context for some someone um, who hasn't been to Haiti um, or or a rural part of a developing country? Um, the I, th I feel like words like 
finding a job or education um, in the United States, there are a lot, of, a lot of times it's just a very casual conversation, right? Like, what do you do? Or, you know, what's your major? Um, but for those who don't understand the complexities and lack of opportunity, can you shed a bit of light of what, what it might look like for somebody who's growing up in rural Haiti? Yeah. Um, it's who's your dad? Who's your mom? Who's your uncle? Who's your aunt? Who's your godfather? Who's your godmother? Because it's how you get job. It's through the connection. It was who knows who. So oftentimes you'll hear you got to have a godfather in that place to get a job with that organization. Um, so if you don't have a connect, it's going to be very hard. And these are people who are very, you know, and I feel bad because I'm like, they study so hard. These young folks study so hard. People who are so brilliant and so smart, and yet they don't have the opportunity. That is you know, heartbreaking. Um, I know for me, um, before coming to the United States, um, I had said to myself, all right, I'm not going to do that much time in school. I'm not going to waste my time. I was about an eight when I realized, seven or eight years old when I said that to myself. I'm not doing all that. See, you know, kids come from school and they spend the whole day doing homework. You know, they're getting yelled at. They're getting spanked for not knowing their lesson. And then they're taking the book. They're going back and, you know, there's this way of studying in Haiti. You go back and forth with the book. You basically, you memorize and everything, go back. I said, I don't have time for all of that. I'm not doing all of that. So for me, my role models were my, my grandparents. My grandfather was a cook fighter and my grandma was a merchant. So I saw them as business. Um, during the summertime, sometime during the weekdays and the weekend, they'll do farming. They both do it together. So, I, and then when they go to farming or go to the shop or whatnot, I'm the one who was left behind to run it. So I was the one that was selling the, 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 the produce. When I was selling the candy, I was selling the cigarette, I was selling the liquor, I was selling all of that at seven years old, eight years old. So I knew all I had to do for me was to learn to count, add, subtract, and we in business. So that was my thing. But in Haiti, um, it's just sad to see a lot of kids, a lot of people who are super smart um, do not get an opportunity um, for employment. So it's really about who you know. And that's why I'm so proud with Capital Care because now it's like, okay, those young talents, we could train them. So you could come to Capital Care. You don't have to know a thing about healthcare. You don't have to know a thing about public health. We'll train you on the job to be able to do the work of the organization. So I'm excited about providing those opportunities to folks in Haiti. So it's really difficult. I mean, even here, we know it's network, right? But the only difference here, like you mentioned, you know, you have a resume, you know, you learn something, you're from school, whatnot, and then, you know, you have, might have a, a, a ref, might give you a reference, you get unemployment. Down there, it's 10 times harder to do that. You have a, you have a population that's 70% unemployed. It's all, it's people are just living based on their creativity you know, creating something. So if they buy a, a big bag of rice, then they're gonna portion that to sell to their neighbors, you know, to make a low profit. So it's very difficult about, you know, getting employment in Haiti. Yeah, that's well said. I appreciate you um, sharing that with us. I think it's important to take a step back sometimes and kind of look big picture uh, for, again, for listeners who might not have had the experience um, of, of that type of rural life in the developing world. What advice do you have for nonprofits? I mean, Haiti uh, has been labeled the republic of NGOs, right? There's, uh, you know, more NGOs per capita than any other country in the world. And geographically, it's a fairly small island. Um, but, you know, there's so many people that are working there, so many um, people who are trying to do good. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of times we don't always do the best. Um, what would be your advice to those listeners today? I'd say, you know, work with the locals. Um, if you really come to do work in Haiti, you know, work with the locals. Um, find a way to provide opportunity where the money is spent in Haiti. Um, I think that's the biggest challenge. Um, the money doesn't make it to Haiti. <laughs> unfortunately, it doesn't get spent there. So it doesn't really have the, as big of impact as it should. Listen, Haiti is the size of Maryland. They got it together down there. They organized. I mean, why can't we organize something more it's structured in a population of 11 million people? It's not that complicated. The United States is over 300 million people. They get it together, right? So 10 million, 
that should be a breeze. You should have somebody who's like a billionaire who have you know over a billion dollars or whatnot who could just come in and turn the whole thing around. Is this a matter of really providing opportunity? Yeah, just be honest. Provide opportunities that's gonna actually benefit the community. Now there is no shame in making your money. It's fine. It's business. Somebody has to make their money. But just be more honest and say, you know what? We'll make sure eighty percent is spent in Haiti and twenty percent is from the other operation aspects of whatever. Is is that the way it seems to work now? Is much more of it is not being spent in Haiti, and that's what the, that's that's what's really giving NGOs a bad name because at the end of the day, the people are not getting it, and it's not making a bigger impact for a lot of organizations that have like millions, several millions of dollars in our, in their operations. They should be able to go to a local community like a fourth grade of 20,000 people and really have an impact and say, see, this is it. You don't have to explain it. Because of you, all of this transformed. And it can be done. It don't require a whole lot. It's just that the, the work that's being done is, a lot of it is one, not sustainable. Two, the impact is just not enough. They're not showing enough people how to fish. So please incorporate more development work, more training work more skills for work that people can basically use. And that's not that when the program decide to leave Haiti and bam, it's a wrap. Everything is over. They can't do nothing with what they, with, you know, with what you were doing before because now you're no longer a source. I think that's, that's the biggest this, um, favor folks can do, but that's the biggest way you could actually make an impact. Work with those locals and make sure that, you know, you're treating them fairly in the wage. Make the wage fair. I mean, come on, make the wage fair. And the thing is, Haiti doesn't produce much, right? They're buying everything from everywhere else. What makes you think it's okay to not give them a fair wage? I mean, you, you couldn't live of what you're paying them. Um, so I'm not saying, you know, here, you know, give people 50, 50, 50K a year. I'm not saying all of that. I'm just saying, to be more mindful that make the wage more fair and have the money really be buying local produce and encourage local production, local usage, as, as a, as a, instead of you know, sending everything over. That's what I would give the, as my recommendation. It's not the most sexiest recommendation. It's not the easiest recommendation, but it's the right thing to do. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I think you said it so well. Um, and it's important that we continue to have those conversations because we need to, we need to hear it, um, you know, as foreigners. And I've seen so many, so many, yeah, after the earthquake, you know, um, in 2010, so many organizations come down. And then within a few years after, the, you know, the next big um, disaster happens in a different country all that money is pulled out of haiti and put back into the next country and the the impact is is no longer there when that um, organization isn't on the ground and after you know decades of this happening it's very difficult to develop trust within the culture and trust within the any any community um, because there's been so much turnover so uh, I appreciate you sharing that. And I, and I think even though it might make people uncomfortable to hear it, we need to be uncomfortable because that's where, that's where we can really push the envelope and start to come up with innovative ideas of what's really going to work. Yeah, and you said right there, trust. We have a big issue in Haiti with trust. First of all, Haitians don't trust each other, but now you coming in they, with, you, with you helping and they trust you to come in, they embrace you. And then you not yielding what you're supposed to. So now they stop trusting you. So now they they really lost. We don't know to trust our own, to trust you know the foreigners, because we just not we're not getting that. Um, and I think for for us as an organization, I don't, when I when, I, when I'm on the ground, I am real with them at a, as a hundred percent because I grew up from there. I went to those local schools. I walked those those grounds. I walked 45 minutes, you know, from from my house um to my school. I work an hour and a half from um, my house to the city and, and uh, um, to go purchase and stuff. I work in those hot sun. I used to plant sweet potato. You know, I used to plant corn. I used to cut the sugar cane. Mind you, I left at nine years old. So, you know, I've gotten um, 
you know, I've had to run home when it was raining very hard because I know if I don't get to cross the river in, in, in due time, the canal will be swollen and I'll be stuck on the other side. Now, of course, I could sleep over because I have families where, where I was at. But I've experienced it. You know, I was there in 1986 when they were throwing over the whole dictatorship regime under Papa da, uh, um, uh, Baby Da. So I've experienced Haiti. Um, and since I left at nine, I've always go back. So I've had that real experience. So as a result, I can, I've had that real conversation with folks and said, listen, this is how this works. This is how you could play a role. Um, because a lot of the time is they don't understand how the organization function. So they think every organization is rich and it's not. Yeah. Bucky is not rich, but there are some who are rich. But a lot of the time, people do not understand how it really, how the organization actually impact and function in Haiti. So as a result, they can't trust because what they see, nothing is being changed. So they lost that trust in people. They lost that trust in organization. That's why for us, we don't go by NGO because it's almost like it become a dirty word to say, oh, NGO. Mm-hmm. One is dirty, or if you say it, you rich. So you got money. <laughs> so trust is a big thing. People have lost trust in a lot of this organization who's doing work. And that's why I said earlier, the best thing you can do is really work with those who are more hands-on, more local, and, um, and be fair. Um, if you are fair, um, you know, you reap what you sow. Thanks, John Pierre. That is so important as we talk about um, building up local leadership. I would love to hear your opinion and also your uh, strategy on how that works um, with Capra Care. Well, like I said earlier, talents, right? Um, we have a lot of people who went to school, um, dedicate themselves to their education, and they finish um, with school and they have a hard time finding a job. So for capital care, we recruit people strictly from locals um, in Haiti. You don't have to have had years of experience. As long as you have the ability to speak right and present yourself, we can train you on the job how to do the work. So that's what we've done. 11 years of capital care, um, the average age of our staff is about 32 years old. Um, the average time that they spend with capital care, which is 11 years, is about seven years old. Um, we have staff who was there with us since day one and we've trained them. And these are the people who started on the same level and then they started, you know, uh, 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 shaping themselves in, into, okay, this person has potential to be a manager. So we train that person and the person has potential to grow and we train that person. Now you have the same ones who are there who are now the program, uh, um, uh, managers, the program administrators, the program directors, the community health workers, it's them. So now, and that's because we had a long-term plan. So we, we had a long-term plan. So we recruit locally. So, but we understand it can be very hard for other organization who wants to come in and, you know, push, 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 crush, 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 don't have time for that. So you're going to pay a lot more to hire professionals. But what's going to end up happening is um, you might not have the kind of culture, the kind of trust, the kind of synergy within your staff. So our strategy was to recruit locally and recruit young. So some of our staff now who are 32, 33, they were 22, 23, 21. Like I said, um, we have um, a couple of staff right now. Well, one of them, Simpson, who's 20 years old. Um, he was 10 years old. He's, he's, he's 21 now, just turned 21. He was 10 years old in our youth program. And now he's a staff of Capital Care. So we are very patient in our approach to be very selective and select the right people to lead and run the organization locally. So we are 100% staffed by locals. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's rare that I get to hear that. So that's something to be celebrated. Um, so for the listeners today, um, what can people do to get involved with, with what's happening? Well, with Zoom, you can get involved from wherever you at. Uh, we have members who are in different states throughout the United States, and we have members who are in different parts of the world. Um, all you need is a Zoom connection, internet connection. Um, we have committees um, on this side who helps to provide support and guidance and um, help us with the infrastructure development of capital care. So whatever your career is, it doesn't have to be public health. You sp- if you want to make an impact, Give me a call. Send me an email. Um, 
my full name, Jean-Pierre Louis at capocare.org, uh, or info at capocare.org. You know, follow us on our social media pages. And, and I'm, on, I'm on social media at, at, um, at Jean-Pierre Louis or at Capra JPL. But I'm not hard to find. Um, see our website, um, www.capocare.org. And then talk to me. Let's have a conversation. I will definitely find a way for you to be able to make an impact. Like I said, you don't have to be a nurse or a doctor. As long as you're a health, uh, 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 as long as you're a professional, um, you've worked and you want to make an impact and I will find a way um, to guide you. Um, we have different committees that's helped out. We have people who help with fundraising. Now we think like dedicating your birthday to an organization. You could dedicate your birthday to Capital Care easily on Facebook. The funds come to an organization. You can do a book club for Capital Care. There are so many different ways that you can help to raise money or you could help to add value by being hands-on. You could give as little as 1% of your time or as much as 100% of your time. If you want to do something with us, just give us a holla. That's great. I'll be sure to include uh, Jean-Pierre's information and contact information in the show notes as well with all the appropriate links. So Jean-Pierre, as we wrap up, I would love to hear from you. Um, what is one thing you would want listeners to take with them today? That, um, that you, that you should have a, you can make a difference in that everyone on this earth has a purpose. Find out what your purpose is. And be honest with yourself. And if you really have a purpose um, to bring about positive change in this world, it can happen. The only thing I would say is be 100% real with yourself that your purpose is not one that's created for your own benefits. Make it a purpose that's about helping other people and adding value. Um, And if you don't make it about yourself, then I mean you can never be offended by someone who says, no, that's not for me. No, I don't want it like that. No, this is how, this is how I prefer it. Then, you know, we'll be okay. Oftentimes what you find is people want to go and be saviors and heroes and they want to impose all their um, imperfectness on other people and say, this is how it's supposed to be. Um, so find the right purpose and be true, be 100% true to yourself and be 100% honest with yourself and be fair. Um, if you do it that way, I think when you do leave this earth, which we know during this COVID-19 time, it's, you know, how valuable our life is and how precious time is. When you are no longer here, people will say, wow, you know what? You didn't come here and wasted your time. You came here and you, you, you made an impact. You left your imprint. Uh, and that could be a legacy. That is a good thing. People will remember you for your good deeds. So be kind, find the right purpose, be kind, be fair, and be honest with people. And it will be okay. That will be my parting words. That's fantastic. I think um, your story is such an inspiration. I have absolute respect for the way that Capricare is approaching this massive topic of public health that very few people have been able to really establish a sustainable model in Haiti yet. And so I'm super excited for our listeners to hear about this, to be encouraged by it and to connect with you and to get involved in what Capricare is doing. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much, Kelly, for the opportunity. I appreciate you a hundred percent. And thank you to everyone who um, made their time to listen to the podcast. I hope you will love what you hear. You learn a few things about, you know, Capricare and what we do and that you will also share the podcast on your social media and encourage people to, you know, follow the podcast as well. Thank you. Thanks, John Pierre. Special thank you to the Global Health Pursuit for the initial introduction with John Pierre. You can learn more at capracare.org. That's C-A-P-R-A-C-A-R-E dot org. You can find us at lapointfoundation.org or on Instagram at lapointfoundation. Until next time, keep on fighting for justice.